we want to have a conversation here and uh, uh, talk with Daryl a little bit. And, uh, you know, everybody knows uh, a few things about you, but I think over the next few minutes, we're going to have the opportunity to, to get to know a lot more about Daryl yeah. and his amazing story. Man, we just can't thank you enough for coming. Uh, lives in St. Louis now, but uh, flew in for this weekend for you guys, and I'm just so grateful. So first of all, just thanks again for coming. We really, really appreciate you thank coming. You. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Pastor Ben. I appreciate yeah. it. So uh, let's talk a little baseball f first. Um, so you, your favorite, your favorite uh, team to play for. You played for how many teams total? Four. Four teams. Yes. And by the way, this is a fun trivia thing, right? It is. Daryl is one. Of, go ahead, you tell him. I'm one of four players who played on all four teams. From New York City. From New York City. Yeah, all the New York teams. The Mets, Dodgers, Yankees, and Giants. Brooklyn Dodgers, New York Giants, New York Yankees, New York Mets. Played for all four. One of only four players in MLB history. I think that's cool. Yeah, that's pretty so cool. So what was your favorite team to play for? Uh, probably the 86 Mets. Why? Oh, uh, because we were a little crazy, you know. And <laughs> You know, baseball, and I, I realized one thing, you know, we, were, we had came into the 86 season, and... We lost to the uh, Cubs in 84, lost to the Cardinals in 85, and we came in 86 spring training, and Davey Johnson was the manager, and the first thing he said, we're going to win it all. And we kind of looked around, and we thought to ourselves, yeah, we're going to win it all this year. And, and then I thought that was pretty cool, you know, to really be able to think, think that way coming in, because we was not going to let anybody step on our neck anymore. And we came out of spring training, and we just – we kind of started off, you know, slow, one and four, and they was like, yeah, right, they're going to win it all. And then we just kind of took off, and nobody was able to catch us. We just, we just kind of ran through everybody uh, through the course of the regular season. And, you know, to be able to have that confidence in your team and who you are, I think is important. And we realize that, and we, we always have to say our manager – put us in that place to believe that we can win it all. Yeah, him saying it probably helped make it happen a little bit, put a belief in your, in your gut. Yes. <laughs> so some of your favorite, some of your favorite plays uh, of your uh, amazing 17-year career, what were some of the favorite moments on the field or off the field uh, with baseball? I think some of the moments were, you know, hitting big home runs, you know, hitting them one in the World Series. and um, 86, I, Matt. 86, yeah, and I think when we clinched in 86 and – you know, because I had watched baseball for a very long time growing up as a kid in, uh, in L.A. and being a Dodger fan. And um, when you watch baseball and you see, you know, teams in the playoffs and you see teams going to the playoffs, clinching the division, it was always exciting. Because back then, you know, when you watch it, they allowed the fans to run on the field. You know, and we had, we had that in 86, you know, when we clinched at home against the Cubs. You know, the fans just took over the field, you know, and it was just the thing that I always wanted to be a part of as mm -hmm. a kid and watching that. And here it is. I'm living that dream, you know, uh, at, you know, that year of being able to see that. What an exciting time. I think. Yeah. You had such a you, you made such a bang to begin with. You were rookie of the year, came in, just took off. You're on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Not telling how many times. Yeah, don't say it. But um, but so, so tell us about that, though. As you came into baseball, um, there's baseball and then there's Major League Baseball. And then you had incredible success early and you're in New York City. So what was it like playing in the Major Leagues for you? How old were you when you came up? Um, well, for, hey, before we do that, let's go. Let's talk about Lynchburg. Yeah. Let's talk because first uh, two and a half years in the minors, two right? Two and a half years in the minors. And what was that like? And what did you learn from that first? Um, I learned a lot of hard lessons. I, I learned to, you know, really uh, control myself, you know, because in Lynchburg, you know, I was playing in the minor leagues and, you know, there were a lot of things being said to me, racial things. And, and, and my manager was so cool, Gene Dusan, he, he was a white manager. And he was like, you know, every time I was running back to the dugout, he was like, don't look up there, you know, because he just like, they were saying things and he just figured that, you know, I would take a bat and run up there and eliminate people. <laughs> <laughs> So he was telling me, don't look up there. And I came this close to quitting. You know, I was, I was lost. I was confused. And I was smoking marijuana every day and down in the minor leagues. And, and then what happened was is they s sent a player down there to help me. And his name was Lloyd McClendon. You know, he was our catcher. He got hurt in spring training and broke his, broke his wrist, you know, got hit with a bat. And he was supposed to 
uh, be my roommate and I ended up with somebody else and I ended up just being lost and, and I went AWOL and I just wanted to quit and, and, and I'm glad I didn't. And I, that, that, was a, that was a learning lesson for me, never to quit. No matter what life brings you, you just don't quit. Because I did before in high school. I quit in high school in my uh, freshman year and the coach thumped me in the head and I took the uniform off and I threw it in his face and quit. And then I learned from that, learned that lesson that I would never quit again. I came close to quitting. And had I quit, I would have never been, you know, the player that I ended up being in the major league. So that's, that's for anybody in life. Don't ever quit, whatever it may seem like. I mean, at wow. every stop, little stop in, in life, you know, God has a plan, you know, yeah. and, and we just don't know it sometimes. And I think realizing that I didn't know the plan would be great. Don't let adversity uh, stop you in your tracks. Yes. So... Uh, you then you roll up in, you're called up, you're 21 years old and you get up to the majors? 21 when I got to the big leagues. Wow. Okay. So when you're in New York City. Yeah. What, ha what tell us about that. Um, this sounds like a recipe for some bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of things can happen. You know, it's New York City. And I think the general manager, Frank Cashman, Cashman I mean, uh, did not want me coming up early. Uh, I could have left out of spring training that year. And he didn't want me coming up because it had nothing to do with the baseball ability, but it had to do with the lifestyle. I think he was more concerned about young players coming into New York City. Had it been somewhere, you know, like, you know, Seattle or something like that, it would have been different. You wouldn't have had to have so much pressure. You didn't have to deal with the media so much. You know, it's so much media in New York and every outlet has their own opinion and story about you. And, you know, I came up and, you know, I struggled. I got off to a rough start from the beginning. And I just remember my first road trip, and this happened to me on my first road trip. I was 21. I just wanted to fit in with the guys. And, you know, a veteran player sent me to the back of the plane, and he said, go to the back of the plane, got something for you. They sent me to the back of the plane in the bathroom. I go back there, and there it was. They introduced me to cocaine. And that's how I got introduced to the big leagues. They said, welcome to the big league, kids. This is what the big leagues is all about. And then they took me out to a nightclub that night and showed me all the women. They said, this is what the big leagues is all about. So I really got introduced to all the wrong things coming up at, 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 at a young age. Uh, I kind of wanted to just be a part of it. So I hit the cocaine. I went to the club and saw the girls. And I thought to myself, you know, I have arrived. You know, you're 21 years old. What else do you know? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that began a path that kind of led to some hard stuff we'll get to in, in a little bit. Um, but with it came a, a lot of success. Uh, man, I mean, just everything you did, you were, you were just playing baseball and you were really, really good at it. Uh, but there was also some health stuff along the way that, I mean, some people maybe forgot about. Tell us, uh, fast forward up to 1998. Tell us about what happened in 98. Well, 98, I was playing with the Yankees and, of course, you know, we were beating up on the Orioles and everybody. <laughs> <laughs> time out, time out, time out. That wasn't in the script, huh? <laughs> what, uh, tell us about Cal Ripken. Uh, t time out, tell us about Cal Ripken. Cal was, Cal was great, you know, he was, he was phenomenal, you know, for him to be able to uh, do what he did as, as a player in the streak that he had, you know, no one's probably gonna ever break that, you know. Yeah. That's remarkable, it's hard to do, so. Yeah. Um, but it was great, you know, in the 98, Yankees were great, you know, I played with them and I played that season. And I just remember going through that season and playing and I was doing well with the Yankees. And I remember, you know, feeling sick, you know, at time for time. And, you know, I remember having like blood in my stool all the time. And I was telling my wife, Sharif, that, I, you know, I think something's wrong, but I would go to the ballpark and I would drink Maalox every day. See, a ball player never want to say he's hurt or injured because if you do, you're coming out of the lineup, you're not going to be playing. And I was playing a lot. So, you know, and I was losing weight. And then at the end of the year, September, I said, I'll wait to September and I'll go in and see the, see, see the doctor. You guys are still making a run at the playoffs Yeah, at we that were making time. a run at the playoffs. And we were already getting in the playoffs because that 98 Yankee team, just we kind of just ran away with everything. But September came and what happened was is I went to the doctor and, and um, to, you know, get a checkup and everything. And, and there it was, you know, the checkup was I had a, I had a tumor in me, you know, and it was colon cancer. And I wasn't able to go into the 98 playoffs. I was, I, was, I was scheduled to have surgery immediately because of the fact that the tumor was in me. And, and it was so funny, you know, I mean, it's not funny, but it's cancer, you know. And the doctor said when he cut me open, he said, wow, you know, I realized one thing, you know, that you were so healthy physically that the tumor stayed in one place because of your abs. 
He said it kept the tumor in one place. It didn't move the tumor because he said you could have ran, you could have slid, you could have swung the bat and everything, and the tumor could have burst and spread it throughout your whole body, you know. And, and there's another moment of God being in the middle of mm -hmm. things. We, we don't know. I mean, when I look back, I see those things, you know. Now I realize, you know, I see the things that he was in the middle of all these different things, you know, because I would go on to have cancer again in 2000. It, would, it, it reoccurred, you know, in 2000, and I would have to have my left kidney moved because now the tumor was sitting there under my left kidney. Yeah. So there's, I remember the news about all that, you know, the, the World Series is happening, you're in the hospital, George Steinbrenner comes and just stays in your Kinda room. Kind of hangs out. They said he sat there for three hours, you know, and I was out of it, you know, and, you know, after surgery, surgery was a long surgery, and they, they said George came to the hospital, and he sat there, and he just, they said he just sat there, you know, he sat there, just wanted to yeah. be there with me by my side while the team was away. Um, playing in the playoffs and everything and on their way to the series, you know, he was there and, you know, George, George, a lot of people don't know. They just talk about, well, you know, he was this way and he by a team. I like playing for a man that want to win, you know, mm -hmm. and that pays you well, if, but if, yeah, if you're going to play sports, you want to be somewhere where you have an opportunity to win. And that's what it was with him. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, you know, his heart, he, was, he always liked the underdog. He was just different than any other owner, you know. He liked people that pe other people didn't like, he liked them. That's cool. So you're a cancer survivor twice. Um, baseball uh, baseball um, started for you at an early age, but your upbringing uh, was not easy. Tell us about uh, some of the background that you come from with your father and walk us through some of that, Daryl. Yeah, that's a good question, you know, because people always see, you know, you put on a uniform and you excel and you're very talented and then they see the problems and they say, what's wrong? Um, a lot of times people don't know where people come from. You know, I come from a background of a dysfunctional um, home. You know, my dad was a raging alcoholic and, you know, he used to beat the living crap out of me and he told me I would never amount to anything. And he came home for the last time when I was about 14 years old and... You know, he pulled out a shotgun and said he was going to kill the whole family. And me and my brothers went into action. And had it not been for my mother getting us out of that house, we knew she was serious because she was like, get out of the house and go down to the neighbors. And had she not pointed, because we were there, my brother Ronnie grabbed a butcher knife and I grabbed a frying pan. And we came this close, you know, we came this close to killing him. So I always say there could have been a tragedy in my life before I ever put the uniform on. So what does that mean? I'm already broken before I ever put the uniform on. My pain is real, it's deep. And I always tell people my pain led me to my greatness. See, because pain can lead you to greatness. It drives you. Yeah, it drives you more than anything. And my greatness would eventually lead me to my destructive behavior because that's the real reality of it because you're not well. You know, you're not well on the inside. We, you can look well from the outside, the standpoint of being 6'6", strong and everything else from the outside. And people say, well, look at him. He's physically talented, but what's wrong? Uh, brokenness is real. And I, I think we don't understand lawlessness brings about brokenness. It just keeps bringing on a broken generation until someone breaks that curse off of the kid's life. And, you know, my father was an abusive man and, and I ended up keeping him out of my whole life and my whole career. So he came to games, but he just watched on his own? Just watched from, yeah. Watched. Didn't know your kids? Didn't, I never got a chance to meet his grandkids. And, you know, I, I, I hated him, you know, because of what he did to my mother, you know, and I, I used to cry at night and say, I'm going to take care of my mother. You know, I'm going to make sure that she doesn't have anything to worry about. And, and my sister was laughing, you know, and it was like I was 14 years old. And I said, we want to play in the big leagues and, and I'm just going to take care of my mom. And they said, well, my, my, like I said, my sister would laugh and say, you go, right, yeah, right, you go play in the big leagues. I say, watch, you know, and I'm going to take care of mom and everything because of my father, he abused abused her so much, you know, and, and we just hated him. I hated him. I kept him out of my life and career. And um, then, then I go to this place, you know, after being, you know, transformed by God. And, and my father was in the hospital down in San Diego, and, and, and God speaks to me. I'm going to do a, a men's prayer breakfast in California. And God speaks to me on a Friday night. He says, I want you to go down and see your father in the hospital, and I want you to repent to him. I said, really? <laughs> I called my wife to pray for me. I said, you need to pray for me. God is all over me. 
And she said, you need to do what he said. So Sunday came and I go down to see him and do exactly what God had told me to do. I said, you know, the Lord changed my life and I just need to ask you to forgive me for keeping you out of my life and my career and your grandkids, missing your grandkids. Will you forgive me? And he said, yes. And a tear came out of his eye and I lost it. I laid there and I just cried so hard. I laid in his lap and I just cried so mm -hmm. hard because there it was. I was wrong and he was wrong. And God was showing me that two wrongs don't make it right. Mm -hmm. And he forgave me in that situation. And I remember God speaking to me and says, how dare you not forgive him and I forgave you. I gave you grace, now you go give him grace. Wow. And I gave him the grace that God told me to do. I was obedient to God and then God said, raise up after that. And then he said, raise up. And he says, now lead him in the center of prayer. I said, you know the Lord has changed me? Would you like to accept him as Lord over your life? And he shook and said, yeah. So I said, will you repeat after me? And he repeated after me and I led him in the prayer. And there it was, I cried again. I was so emotional. And there was the man that rejected me and beat me. I led him to the Lord. And the Lord told me one thing in the middle of that after I was leaving, going back home crying. He said the forgiveness was not for him. The forgiveness was for me. That's why I stayed hurt all those years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's just something about us you know, that we don't understand. You know, we don't understand. We think we're hurting them, but we're actually hurting our own self, and I couldn't get free. Mm -hmm. And I was immediately released from the pain of him and all I went through in all those years, you know, after I released him, because I didn't release him. I carried him with me all those years, and that's why I never got free. That's why the brokenness was so heavy on my life, because... What I learned with God in that is it's never about us. We think it's about us, mm. you know, and we think, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing right by keeping you out of my life and not letting you be a part. And, it, and it's really not. And God showed me through that whole process. And I learned from that. I learned a, a valuable lesson from God there that, you know, um, for God to be able to use you, you cannot make it about you. You know, and he made he made me see that and understand that before because he was using me, but he wanted to use me in a whole different way. Yeah. And I could never get to that place because I was holding these grudges against my father and I wouldn't let him go. It was holding you back. Yeah, it was holding me back. Wow. Oh, that's a that's a powerful, powerful story about the difference that uh, your life had when Jesus came into it, which we're going to hear more about in a moment as well. Daryl, uh, so you you. um you broke the law, uh, and they put you in jail. You did, uh, what, 10 or 11 months? I'm not telling you something you didn't know. It's like, um, so that's a profound experience. Um, tell us about, because God, you know, we were, we were saying when we were talking about this, God doesn't waste anything. So you hear about jail being such a horrible thing, but God didn't waste that. How, how did God use that in your life? What was the jail experience like? God does not waste anything. You're right, Pastor. Uh, he does not, does not. And I think we as people, we think, you know, he does. And he, he's, he's always... He doesn't know what's going on, what, yeah, what's happening here. Exactly. And he knows everything. You know, he's got a plan. You know, he, he has to take a person's life where it's at. And that's what he did in my life. He stopped me at every turn so he didn't let the enemy kill me. Mm -hmm. So he stopped me. You know, it was the cancer it was the addiction, you know, I should have been dead from that many times, the drug addiction, you know, but he kept stopping the enemy, you know, he kept using people to stop, to intervene in my life through the drug addiction of my wife and, you know, going to jail and, and being locked up, you know, that was God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself, mm -hmm. you know, to slow me down because he had a plan. And see, mm -hmm. we don't know what his plan is and we can't know his plan if we don't know him. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know him you know, during that period of time. I knew my mother, my mother was a Christian and she prayed for me and I, my mother raised me right. I sit here in front of all of you. My mother raised me my, right. I made a decision to live a heathen lifestyle. So guess what? You live a heathen lifestyle, there's a price that's gotta be paid. And that's the reality. I don't care if you Daryl Strawberry, I don't care if you who, you know, you see so many celebrities live such a heathen lifestyle, they don't even make it out. They end up ODing and dying you know, because they won't quit. 
And at every stop, God was stopping me, you know, through all the things that I had to go through. He stopped me, even the jail time, going to jail, 18 months sentence. Um, but it was so, it was so clear to me because the first judge I was in front of, Judge uh, Foster, she was the lady, and the prosecutor wanted to send me to prison. And she goes, he's not a criminal, he has a drug problem. You know, she said, well, he's a myth to society. And she goes, no, he's not. She goes, he has a drug problem. He's never committed a crime. You know, he's never done anything. The only crime he committed was to himself, you know, with the problem he had. So, and she got sick and she got off the, off the bench. And then another judge came and I stood in front of him. My, my um, lawyer said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want, told him to lock me up. You know, I was so broken and so lost. I, I said, I just want to go to prison. I don't want to go to treatment no more. I'm not doing another year, two years on probation because I'll never make it. I, every time I got on probation, I violated probation with something and, and I was in trouble again. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned this, um, how God used that. And also just the rock bottom nature of the addiction really is, is was, was one of the turning points. I mean, you're sleeping behind dumpsters. You're, I mean, this is a bad situation. Tell us about uh, your, 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 your wife and pulling you out. I want to hear what was the beginning of that turn and her intervention in your life and how did God use that to turn you around? Well, I, I think addiction is so powerful, Pastor, and you end up in places that you never can imagine and you stay longer than you want to stay. Um, you end up jail, either jail institution or death. You know, I ended up in jail. I ended up in a psych ward. I just didn't die. And I, I think because God had a plan and and of course, my wife today, Tracy, 15 years of marriage, and, and she's got 22 years in recovery. And she had one year of recovery. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She had one year of recovery at the time we met at a uh, convention, um, a recovery convention. And, and I told her, I said, you don't want to get involved with me. You know? <laughs> I said, I run through people like a tornado. And I did. I ran through two, two families like a tornado because I was selfish and self-centered. Uh, through my addiction and I hurt so many people. Um, but I was able to go back and make the amends to those afterwards. But uh, Tracy was the turning point in my life. You know, God used her to pull me out of dope houses down in South Florida. I was shooting dope, smoking, smoking crack. And I was $3 million in debt and didn't have a driver's license. And she was banging on doors and pulling me out. I thought, man, she's crazier than me, you know? <laughs> and she was like, God's got a plan for you. I says, why don't you and that God just leave me here and let me die. She says, you're just not that lucky, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm saying in that, Pastor, what people need to understand is God always going to do what he's always done. He's always going to use people to help people. Mm. He's not going to do anything different, you yep. know? You know, all the yep. people that he used in the Bible, they all had issues just like us. You know, Moses had a speech impediment. God used him mightily. You know, David was a womanizer. God used him mightily. So he's a man after my own heart. See, it's what God sees in a person that sometimes the person can't see in themselves. And he uses other people to get that person, to bring that person mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. the darkness. And that's what happened to me. You know, he used my wife and she led me back into church. And when we got back into church, uh, it was really cool because I sat for seven years. People, didn't, people think it's just an old, overnight miracle that you know, I dream a genie or something like that. And, you know, it just happens. No, God says, sit in the back of the church. And we sat there for seven years in the back of the church and I got discipled. You know, I missed the discipleship when I got first saved. Tell, back up, let's back up and tell that because this is really important. Um, so you, you um, were at a revival and, and you, you give your life to Christ and you mean it. You're sincere. But then what happened the first time around? on that. Yeah, I gave my life to Christ after going to a crusade and, and, and got radically saved and power of God came over me and there it was and I was talking about Jesus and you know and then then everything came against me you know I ran into the wall dislocated my shoulder I get saved like all of us do we come and get saved and accept Christ but I missed the most important part just like the ingredients on a cake you can bake a cake but if you don't put the cream on the top yeah it's just gonna be a yeah ordinary cake with no cream and I missed the most important part was the discipleship you know, and I think so, so learning, growing, developing in your faith. You got saved, but then you didn't really grow. And what happened? I ran into the wall and dislocated my shoulder. And I went back out to the familiar places of drinking, womanizing, 
and back to everything that I was, uh, that I was doing before. Okay. Um, and I was out there for about another 15 years. Yep. Doing that. Yeah. So the intentions of your heart couldn't follow. It's like Jesus talks about seeds getting planted and you, you got plucked up or the birds ate and because we didn't grow. And so we talk at Mountain all the time about how important that is to get connected with the word, with some other believers and to grow because otherwise we're vulnerable. It doesn't matter how sincere you are in a moment with Jesus, right. you're, 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 you're vulnerable. So, but that is not the end of the story. So you, then you come around again and now timing in your life is ready. And for seven years, you're out of the limelight and you're in church and God's changing your life. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so cool, you know, because God would use this. I always say God got a great sense of humor. <laughs> you know, he would use two women to straighten me out, my mother and my wife. You know, he would use my mother prayers over me that would come to pass that she was praying then he would use tracy to lead me back into the church now he would sit me for seven years and uh, he was sitting me to grow um because the bible talks about my people perish because of lack of knowledge and there's no understanding of the word of god so i realized that i was perishing because i had no knowledge so i had to get the knowledge of what the word was because what i think what what we as people we don't understand the word works you know, but we have to participate in it to make it work. Mm. And I had to go through that process of participating and sitting and learning who God was and, and, and learning how to live according to the biblical principles. And I would sit for seven years going through that process of being discipled. And this is the greatest thing that happened to me. And, and I used to be like, <laughs> while I was sitting, because my, my wife, she's like really well educated in the Bible and She's, she's Dr. Tracy Strawberry, and she got all these degrees and stuff like that because she, she would study the Word, and she would be with God, and she gets up every morning at 5.30, and I said, God, I ain't getting up at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, but not that much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when she gets up like that, she gets up like that, and she knows all this, and she knows all this about God, and I was like, oh, God, why are you always speaking to her? You know, and you're a little you know, bit jealous. I was. I got yeah. jealous. And you know what he told me? He said, because she spends time with me. Mm. And I realized right there mm. that I needed to do something different. And that's when I got at night. I turned off the television, the cell phone, and I started spending time with God. I started saturating myself in the word. And once I started to do that, that's when God started to, to reveal himself to me of who I was, not who anybody else is. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we think it's about who somebody else is. Mm -hmm. If you open the word for yourself and hide out with God, he's going to reveal to you who you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. and I think we miss that across the board because we, we look at other people and we want to, well, I want to be where they at. Well, they had, she, was, she had done something with God to get to where she was at. So I had to do something with God to get to where gotcha. I needed to get. And, and that's where... I started to develop and started understanding the importance of reading the Bible and, and, and hanging out, hanging out with God. Yeah. For so many years, Daryl, you were known, um, you were known because you wore this jersey or another jersey or a Yankees jersey. Um, that was your identity. You were a baseball guy. Who are you today? That's a good point, you know, because I think a lot of times we identify ourselves in what we do instead of who we are. Mm -hmm. And you'll never know who you are if you don't have a relationship with Christ. You'll never, you'll never know. You, you, you just, you'll, go, you'll walk through this life and you'll say, coulda, shoulda, woulda. You know, that's what I could have said. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. Coulda been in the Hall of Fame. Shoulda have been in the Hall of Fame. But one thing I do know that I'm going into the Hall of Faith because I know who I am in Christ. You know, and I think, I, Pastor, in church, I think that's so important for us to understand is to know who you are in Christ, not from these earthly standpoints, because heaven and earth gonna pass away, but not my word. Everything gonna pass away, all this stuff gonna pass away, but the word of God is never gonna pass away. Mm -hmm. And if you take time out to spend time with God, he's gonna deposit something inside of you that no man can give you. That's his gift. You know, that's his gift to all of us. It's a free gift. And what we, I think what we don't understand about the Bible a lot, the Bi it's, a simple, it's a simple book for complicated people. We're very complicated, you know? <laughs> and, it's, and the book has been here forever, so coming to 
you know, reading the Bible and eating the word of God and living it and worshiping God and knowing who you are in Christ is far greater than anything I've achieved from an earthly standpoint. Yeah, I achieved some great things playing baseball, but at the end of the day, it will not mean anything. You know, King Solomon said that in the book of Ecclesiastes, yeah. it's meaningless under the sun without God. You know, not having God as the centerpiece of your life, all these earthly things will not mean nothing because I realized that you, we're gonna die mm -hmm. and they're gonna talk about you for what, a week? <laughs> <laughs> and then they're gonna stop talking about you and they're gonna move on to the next. So I, I just think people, we need to take more time out focused on the kingdom of God and the work that God has called us to do here. I, I think a lot of times we don't think about the work. The work is great. It is unbelievable mm -hmm. when God touches your heart and he goes back to send you to love on other people. It is the greatest work you will ever do. It is the greatest work you will ever see in your lifetime loving somebody and helping somebody and encourage somebody about the symbol of the cross where Jesus died at Calvary. And he got up early Sunday morning with all power in his hand. He was resurrected so we can be that way. Mm. It, it, it's a free gift. You know, I hope you take it. You know, Galatians 2.20 talks about it. It talks about I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Man, with Christ living you, you don't need nothing. Yeah. 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 So let me ask you one last question, Daryl. Um, Jesus made a huge change in your life. Huge change. So there's people out here that are like, they need a change. There's somebody watching, there's somebody here. They need a big change and they don't know. They haven't experienced what you've experienced yet, or they're wondering if it's possible. I want you to talk to them and tell, tell what Jesus means to you and, and what encouragement you might give to someone who needs that change from Jesus. Jesus, oh my God, Jesus mean, means everything to me. And he's there for everybody, not some. You know, he's there for all. See, everybody else is going to be gone. Everybody else is going to point at you. But Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, when you put your trust in him, when you come to have a relationship with him, I didn't want to be a hypocrite no more, straddle on the fence, talking about his name, but denying his power. See, so many of us know his name, but we don't know the power is greater than the name. The name is great, but the power that he displays in a life and what he does, what he comes in to do, when you finally decide to come in and make this relationship with him. And you have to be committed when you make the relationship with him. There's a three letter word that I always talk about fat, F A T, fat. Faithful, accountable, teachable. You have to be faithful, accountable, and teachable by Jesus. And if, he, if you allow him to do that in your life, then he will rescue you, he will redeem you, and he will restore you. That's what Jesus does. He, he, no man can do that. You can search for all these other things, outside things. Hey, well, if I just had a little bit more of this, if we had a little bit more of that. No, if you get more of Jesus, rescue, redeem, and restore, you will understand the purpose of why you are supposed to be here. The creation of us by God was made for good. Adam and Eve in Genesis Three opened up the door for all of us to fall short. I'm no different, but I just decided that I was going to try this Jesus that my wife had fell in love with. And I saw her fall in love with him, and I was jealous. I wanted what she had. Mm -hmm. And when I decided that I was going to enter in, Pastor, I got the same thing she had. Now see why the joy is so great. It's, it's such a great joy. It's greater than anything that you can never experience in your life, you will never experience anything greater than Jesus in your life. No. Amen. Well, 
It's been really good. It's been really good. Uh, there's so much more. You got, you've got got your website and other resources you can check out what Daryl's doing and all the great work you're doing with, with uh, autistic kids and so many other things you're into. Just God bless you and your ministry. Give our greeting uh, from Mountain to, Ms., to Dr. Tracy. I will. And, uh, I say doctor, that makes me mad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding. Hey, um, would you just pray a prayer blessing over our Mountain family and yes. everyone who's listening today? And uh, would you just pray for us? I will, Pastor. Thank, thank you. you. Father, we just come to you and we submit ourselves to you, Father. And we thank you for the grace and mercy and the love that you give to us every day. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this family that's here today. I thank you for every soul that's here today, Father. Father, as you touch the hearts today, may, may they be convicted so you can challenge them, stretch them, and bring them to a greater understanding so they can understand the purpose of creation. You created us all for good, and sometimes we get sidetracked by all these worldly things, Father. But the most important thing, you sent your son that would die for all of us that do, so we can have life and have it more abundantly, Father. I claim abundant life over the lives that are here today. Father, some people are here today, some are online, and they are unsure about uh, the true meaning of who you are, and you are the great I am, and you are the King of kings, and you are the Lord of lords, and you was wounded for our transgression, and you was bruised for our iniquity, but by your stripes, we get to be healed, and we thank you that you went through so much that we can have life at the fullness, Father. I pray for every soul that's here today, Lord. Love on them, Holy Spirit, like never before. Bring them to a place of surrendering themselves. May we submit ourselves to you, and may we give you glory. Send this petition up to you, Father, and we ask that you will seal it over everyone that's here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you. Let's show our thanks again to Daryl. Thank you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Great stuff.